Robert Bruce Foote, Sanganakallu Archaeological Museum at Ballari is located in the culture complex on the Ballari Anantapur Road. It was declared open on 26th of February 2020. The museum is named after Robert Bruce Foote, the father of Indian prehistory. Robert Bruce Foote was a geologist with a passion for documenting the evidence of prehistoric humans and their cultural development through time. Ever since his appointment as a geologist in the British Geological Survey of India, he began his search for early man sites, especially in the region of former Madras Presidency. His efforts at unraveling the remote past of human history of this region were most productive that laid the foundation of prehistoric archaeology in India. In the Royal Seema and Kalyana Karnataka regions, covering the whole of the present-day northern Karnataka and western Andhra Pradesh, he had carried out detailed mapping of geological formations and simultaneously he identified prehistoric sites ranging in time from the Paleolithic to Iron Age. In the Royal Seema region, although he had discovered Paleolithic sites, his focus on understanding the relation between Neolithic sites and ash mounds was uh, emphasized. He also addressed questions relating to Neolithic way of life including its beginning, characteristics and transformation to Iron Age. He also paid attention to economic aspects of Neolithic communities in terms of utilization of various types of rocks, minerals, metals and their procurement from the source region. He identified various types of precious and semi-precious stones which were used for making beads for ornaments. He also attempted to identify subsistence base of the Neolithic communities including cultivation of millets, domestication of cattle, hunting wild animals and processes behind the formation of ash mounds. At Sanganakallu, he identified a large ground stone axe workshop as early as the 1880s. Between 1863 and 1896, Foote discovered more than 450 prehistoric sites in the Madras Presidency and lit up many dark areas of India's past. His early collection of artifacts from the Royal Seema region are preserved in the Indian Museum at Calcutta and the rest are preserved in the Tamil Nadu Government Museum at Egmore in Chennai. After retirement, Bruce Foote published detailed catalogues of his collections stored in the Government Museum at Chennai. Till date, they are an important source of information on prehistoric sites, their nature and variety. Therefore, we thought naming the museum after Robert Bruce Foote is a befitting and lasting tribute to this great servant of Indian prehistory. The floor of the museum has three sections. A. African Roots of Mankind, the Indian Subcontinent's Prehistory and the Prehistory of Kalyana Karnataka. The region of Kalyana Karnataka is rich in Stone Age sites. The well-known sites of Hunsugi Baichipal Valley, Paleolithic sites and scores of Neolithic, Megalithic sites and Ash Mound sites are located in this region. The lower Paleolithic site of Isampur, the oldest known quarry site dated to 1.2 million years ago, is located in the Hunsigi Valley. Our knowledge of the archaeology of the Hunsigi Valley and Sharapur Doab is the result of K. Padaya's intensive research carried out with the application of modern methods and application of the new archaeology and its techniques. A variety of stone tools of the Paleolithic period are on display. Lower Paleolithic artifacts from Bagalkot, Bijapur and Karnul districts are on display. Excavations carried out at Jawalapuram produced a variety of artifacts, infographics showing Middle Paleolithic stone tools buried under volcanic ash and microlithic tools dating back to 35,000 years ago excavated from a rock shelter at Jawalapuram are on display. In order to facilitate an easy comprehension of the subject matter, the first four panels explain the meaning of archaeology and various scientific approaches for reconstructing the human past. This is followed by infographics on human ancestors, stone age subdivisions, human ancestors outside Africa and expansion of hominins out of Africa and the paths of dispersal are also shown. The environment of the Indian subcontinent and the nature and distribution of stone age sites are also on display through infographics. Around the sunken area at the center of the ground floor, 
replicas of human ancestors dating from 35 lakh years ago onwards are on display they are mounted on pyramidal stands along with their basic information their age and their place in the evolutionary sequence this area of study is known as paleoanthropology that is study of human evolution through fossil skeletal material our knowledge of human evolution today is based on this disciplinary study of human fossils from different parts of the world human ancestors or hominids are grouped into a ancients and moderns on the basis of distinctive anatomical features aided by geochronology and dna analysis paleoanthropologists trace the emergence of human kind and expansions from the source region as of today africa leading to the peopling of the earth the paths of dispersal and reconstruct population histories of communities adapted to a variety of geographical environments across the globe anatomically ancient humans who are also called hominins include homo habilis homo erectus kenyanthropus latiops homo ergaster homo heidelbergensis homo neanderthalensis etc they are also referred to as archaic hominins Anatomically modern humans include Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens sapiens, Denisovans, etc. Homo sapiens are widespread across the world. Their biological evolution is the hot topic among paleoanthropologists. Morphologists argue for multi-regional evolution and geneticists argue for their African source around 300,000 years ago or so. These examples are a gift of the gift to the museum by scholars from Cambridge University in England and Texas A&M University in the United States 15 representative replicas of human ancestors from Africa Europe and Asia are on display the famous Lucy skull is also on display along with Homo habilis Homo erectus Homo neanderthals and Homo sapiens examples the first floor gallery of the museum is named after B Subbaraj the first excavator of Sanganakallu in the 1940s under the guidance of H.D. Sankalya. He successfully retraced the footsteps of Robert Brucefoot but as an archaeologist par excellence. Through his excavations, Subarao developed a stratigraphical model of the development of settlement history of the site. Following this work, several archaeological projects were carried out at this site and the recent multidisciplinary investigations have helped in a comprehensive reconstruction of the neolithic and iron age cultures between 2200 and 700 bc new insights on the arch- agricultural practices were obtained from these investigations a variety of small millets pulses cattle sheep and goats were cultivated by the neolithic and iron age people of the area During the period from 1900 BC and 900 BC crops from Southwest Asia and Africa were introduced into the food package of South Indian Neolithic via North Deccan region The bull imagery occupies a special place in the cultural and religious landscape of the inhabitants of Sanganakallu and related sites in the Royal Seema region and beyond indicating the prevalence of fertility cult among the early agricultural communities as one go as one goes around the first floor the sequence of infographics present the neolithic culture of the region in a landscape and environmental perspective all the neolithic sites in the region are associated with granite torinselberg landscapes the vast majority of sites are located on tops of granite hills surrounded by vast rolling plains or pediments the grassland ecosystem of this region was well suited for agro pastoral way of life and cultivation of food crops was dependent on summer monsoon during 3000 to 1400 bc and since 1400 bc small scale irrigation agriculture was developed which facilitated introduction of winter crops from northern deccan and gradually african large millets were also cultivated Archaeological excavations at Sanganakallu have revealed evidence of these activities during the period from 3000 BC to 700 BC. 
Sanganakallu was a large stone axe manufacturing site beginning from around 1300 BC. Simultaneously, wheel thrown black and red ware and varied objects of ornaments were also manufactured. The period also witnessed the emergence of social stratification as evidenced by the special burials for the elite. The sarcophagus the sarcophagus burial pot exhibited on the first floor gallery is one of the prized collections of the museum. This multi-legged boat shaped burial pot with lid was excavated from near the Kodathani ash mound on Ballari Hosapete road. Such, such examples are rare and are known from early Iron Age contexts in southern India. This was the time period when southern India witnessed the emergence of irrigation agriculture, large scale production of material goods for trade and exchange between and among a network of early Iron Age settlements, marking the beginning of urbanization as early as 1400 BC. The significance of the sarcophagus burial can be understood in the rise of complex society, wherein one can visualize the presence of a ruling class and members belonging to this class were given special burial, reflecting on the status of the deceased individual. The sarcophagus contained the remains of a seven-year-old young adult. The sarcophagus itself was surrounded by several ritual black and red ware pots. All these were buried in a pit on the northern edge of the ash mound at Kudathani. As we move further from the sarcophagus, we can see infographics on Sanganakalu excavations revealing evidence of ancient mining of Dolorite Dyke for making groundstone axes. Excavations of a circular feature revealed a stone axe workshop with evidence for a part of it as a residence of the flint knappers. Quarrying and axe flaking started around 1900 BC at Iregudda during the early phase of occupation and reached its maximum development between 1400 and 1200 BC. Sanganakulu area was a major manufacturing center for axes and other stone or lithic assemblages of the Neolithic and early Iron Age periods. The dolerite raw material needed to manufacture neoliths occurs naturally in the form of intrusive dikes within the granite at Hiregudda and this made it an ideal lithic production center. The high proportion of granite grindstones and backed microliths in the early phase of occupation and the associated numerous Cooked bones and rich archaeobotanical evidence for pulses and millet grains adds weight to the hypothesis that food processing and feasting were associated with Ashmond creation. Evidence for handmade and wheelmade pottery is clearly revealed at Sanganakalu, especially wheelmade and burnt pottery, which is black and red ware, dates from 1300 BC. A variety of stone beads, symbolic objects, and numerous bull figures figurines are commonly found a large number of animal bones represent cattle sheep goats chicken fish etc a variety of beads including disc beads barrel beads spherical beads from steatite agate carnelian and crystal quartz are common Radiocarbon chronology has helped in tracing the beginning of Neolithic way of life in the region from around 3000 BC. The sites in the Bellari region appear to date from about 2400 BC. At this stage, we have clear evidence of agricultural production independent of influence from North Deccan region. Local millets and pulses were the first cultivated crops. Archaeological research at Tekalukota has projected similar development of Neolithic and early Iron Age cultural periods. Megalithic features, which most likely predate the edicts of Ashoka, are found at both places, indicating that these inscriptions were placed in areas of local importance. Graffiti marks on the ritual pots associated with sarcophagus and on shirts from early Iron Age contexts at Tekalukota suggest that tradition of writing must have existed well before Ashoka's introduction of Brahmi into this region. 
The beginning of early historic period around 3rd century BC is based on the date of the Mauryan inscriptions of Ashoka. Two sets of Ashokan minor rock edicts are found at Nitturu and Odegolam. These edicts are replicated on a huge granite boulder kept in the pavilion to the west of the arched gateway to the Robert Bruce Fort Museum. In the central sunken area of the ground floor, the scaled down model of the Sanganakalu hill complex and various archaeological features associated with the site are highlighted with strip lights and LED lights. This feature can be viewed from the first floor. Let me conduct a brief tour with a group of students. Southern Valley is one famous region where we have the oldest agricultural settlements. And then we come southwards, we have these settlements in provinces, in central India, in, uh, you know, in northwestern, uh, present day northwestern India, in Gujarat, in, uh, in, the, in the Vindhyas and Ganga Valley, in Odisha, and in southern India. So these are different types of pulses, you know, uh, cereals and millets and oil seeds, uh, fiber crops, all of them came to be, you know, identified in the environments where these people were living and uh, also exchanged with, these, uh, with, the, with the people who did not possess these crops and there was exchange network establishing giving rise to gradual expansion. We don't get good evidence of uh, vegetables cultivated, you know, in the, in the past. But we now have this broad, very broad spectrum of vegetables available in the market. Irrespective of different seasons, we have these vegetables. No? So there is, this is all because of what we call green revolution. But to begin with, as you go backwards in time, we may not have all of them you know, cultivated by these people. So these zones have been identified, and that gives us an idea that by about 2500 BC, most of the Indian subcontinent, excluding those areas occupied by hunter-gatherers, modern-day tribals and so on, agriculture, villages, village economies have come into existence. Similarly, we look at this area. This area is known as Maidan region, the plain open country, unlike hilly tracks, you know, along the western guards, eastern guards, in the large valleys of Ganga and the Indus and so on. Here, we are exposed to this kind of rocky landscapes, but you know, they are basically open, plain open countries, grasslands, low rainfall area and so on. So we describe the characteristic features of this uh, Maidan region, the geology, physiography, topography, then rainfall, and uh, the nature of vegetation. We have seen here different types. So we have um, tropical forests in the western Ghats. We have tropical ever dry evergreen here in this Karnul region, parkland environments in this area, and then uh, scrubland vegetation and water resources in the hills and so on. So these have been uh, taken into account to explain the way in which uh, early agricultural settlements were coming up in this area. So what are different wild animals which were living, which are living here and were living here? What are different uh, types of animals which could also be hunted by our uh, by human by humans and so on. So this is this is the vegetation, vegetation as well as animal, you know, game animals and wild animals in this area. Mugalari, Raichur, Gurbarka, all this Maidan area. So taking these taking these parameters, we are trying to understand where, how it facilitated human uh, humans, you know, historic human populations to come and settle here and then, you know, giving rise to modern day uh, population distribution across this area. So hilltops were occupied, then the valleys, the river valleys were occupied, then rocky landscapes were also occupied, then we have caves also which were uh, occupied. These are all in the same level. So <coughs> these two people uh, are primarily responsible for our understanding of prehistoric past. As I mentioned, Robert Brucefoot laid the foundation for prehistoric studies pre-independence time period. And uh, in the post-independence time period, this is Professor H. D. Sankali. Uh, he was uh, the one who followed the footsteps of Robert Brucefoot. He sent as many as uh, 50 students. In summary, this museum has been conceived to serve the society at large including the next generation of archaeologists and save prehistoric heritage of the region. Antiquities collected by Ravi Kori Shetter's team through exploration and excavation where food had set foot in the Royal Sima and Kalyana Karnataka region are systematically stored here. 
These objects are catalogued using modern methods and one can see the enthusiastic band of students working at the museum. After a visit to the museum, common man is expected to carry with him the story of human, biological and cultural evolution depicted through infographics and accompanying display of representative artifacts. This museum is designed to be an inclusive one with explanation provided in English, Kannada and Braille and perhaps this is the only museum in India dedicated to Stone Age. The project of this magnitude and purpose could not have been possible without the dedicated and collective efforts of all concerned who were at service to the society at last. With an aim to reach out to local populations and to raise awareness of their remote past in as simple words as possible, this museum has been made possible by sharing responsibility. We would like to thank everyone involved for their contribution. The chief patrons of this museum are the successive deputy commissioners of Bellari since 2009. Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.